Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at another muzzleloading target rifle. This is a rifle by George O. Leonard of Keene, New Hampshire, circa 1868. The barrel is numbered 236 on the muzzle, which is turned down for a starter, and the upper left flat is also marked G.O. O. Leonard, Keene, New Hampshire, cast steel. The fore end is pewter, and the rest of the furniture is steel or iron, including the cap box, which has an eagle-shaped finial, and the toe plate, which has a Swiss-style finial. This rifle is equipped with a nearly full-length brass tube sight with keyhole front aperture. The sight is fitted in a dovetail mount near the muzzle, and an elevation-adjustable rear mount is threaded into the upper tang. The rifle also has adjustable double-set triggers. I picked this rifle for a couple reasons. One, I have a lot of interest in muzzleloading target rifles, as you've seen from several of the pieces that I've selected uh, from my time here in November. But another reason is that uh, I think probably the core reason of that interest in muzzleloading target rifles is I have a, a family history with shooting muzzleloading target rifles. One of them being very much like this. My mother's father, uh, or my grandfather on my mother's side, started shooting muzzleloaders, shooting a muzzleloader very much like this. Uh, and in fact, one of the first muzzleloaders that his father purchased to compete in muzzleloading matches resembles this one very closely, albeit more contemporary version. It has a heavy bull barrel, as I would call it, and a, a more traditional half stock, wood stock, kind of scaled up to accommodate this massive barrel here. Rifles like this and the history of them is near and dear to my heart, and I'm, I'm very blessed and very fortunate to be able to show you this original from 1868 here today. So where did rifles like this come from and, and why were they built, I, I think is maybe the question that many of us would think seeing something like this, especially when you compare it to some of the ornate American long rifles from just 50 years before something like this was made and, and were still being used in some areas of the country during the time that, that this kind of rifle was being built. And I think to talk about that, we need to talk about the pursuit of accuracy that really started with the first firearms and still continues today. Uh, this is an advancement past a normal um, rifled barrel into what I would call kind of the next era of muzzleloading accuracy. By creating these heavy barrels like this, you were able to get a really stable muzzleloader, a really stable rifle, something that we still see today in modern muzzleloading competitions and modern centerfire competitions, where you have to have weight limits and weight classes on your rifles because we can make a gun heavier and heavier and make it more stable and less susceptible to user error or uh, flinching of any kind. This rifle is not the kind of rifle that you would carry uh, going to check your traps along a creek or a river or something. This is purpose-built to be an accurate shooting machine. Starting at the butt end, we have a nice iron butt plate and a nice iron toe plate that wraps around, much like we see and have seen earlier today in the original German target rifle from the 1850s, just shy of 18 years before this rifle was made. Again, kind of two different shooting principles or philosophies. That original German that we looked at being more of an offhand target rifle, this one being a bench rest or some kind of rest supported rifle. We know that by seeing this kind of floral here and you can almost kind of feel it's a little bit flat on that one side maybe from, uh, maybe from experiencing some wear over the years. Coming up the stock here, we see a little bit of curl in the wrist of the rifle. Nothing too fancy, really common for this era of target rifle. And really muzzleloaders in general, not everything was gray, triple A um, grain of wood when it came to stock manufacturing. We come into our trigger guard here, uh, and almost a Hawken era trigger guard on here, really representative of the mid to late 1800s here. Um, just a comfortable American trigger guard here to go along with our set triggers. Our rear trigger here is a traditional curved trigger like we see in many American rifles. And we have a post front trigger here, a little bit heavier than I thought. Being bench rest or rest supported and being so heavy, you can tolerate a little bit of extra squeeze there. You're not as reliant on that hair trigger like you are on an offhand. 
Still rely on it though. I'd much rather have a set trigger than I would uh, than I would not. We have a real simple percussion lock and lock plate here. You might notice though that our our hammer is a little exaggerated. It's a little bit taller, a little bit longer than many of us are used to to accommodate getting up and over this massive barrel and the massive breech that goes along with it. Along the top here, we have our traditional tang going back. Uh, looks like we have two screws in here, one towards the breech and one at the very end, stretching almost back to the cheek rest on this rifle. And in between each of those screws, we have our adjustable post platform for our rear sight. And this really adjusts our brass tube here. So looking at this, looking at this brass tube on an old rifle like this, the idea comes to mind that this is maybe an early scope like we saw on some of the Sharps and some of the um, long range Western rifles. But that's not the case here. This is really and I guess I would call an optical limiter to make sure that you are only focused on your sights. And when you sight down this, you only see just a little bit of light around that front post sight. Um, so you're fixated on your target point on that bullseye. Really neat um, innovation that really didn't see, I don't think, a lot of use because we began to develop optics that really changed that game quite a bit. Still, it's an interesting challenge and, and something neat to see here um, on this original muzzleloader. As we move forward, we have one barrel tenon wedge here. I don't think the barrel is going anywhere though. Um, it's pretty well locked in. Up towards the muzzle here at the end of the forestock, we have a nose cap with a little bit of a lip there. You can see, again, very similar to the German target rifle we looked at earlier. From there, as we move forward, we have a couple ramrod pipes attached directly to the barrel. We don't really have a barrel rib here. Um, with the barrel being so thick, you could think of just the bottom face of the barrel itself being a rib. Um, it is no closer to the bore than a traditional barrel rib would be on a more traditional barrel profiled muzzleloader. At the front here, we have our dovetailed post sight encapsulated in our brass tube here, and at the front of the brass tube, we just have a keyhole profile, only letting in just enough light for you to identify your target post against your target. The bore itself is a 45 caliber and has rather deep square bottom rifling through the barrel. And while we don't see the false muzzle on this piece, like we've seen a lot of contemporary target bench rest or supported muzzle loaders. Um, this is still kind of the grandfather of that, I would say. If you went to a muzzle loading competition that had bench rest or supported rest uh, muzzle loading competitions, you'd see a lot of rifles that looked a lot like this. And uh, some that looked a little bit different as muzzle loading continues to evolve, but you'll see a lot of rifles um, that will bear a lot of similarities to this piece here. I always like to open up the patch box on pieces like this and take a look at it. Again, we see an unfinished inlet interior here. There's no stain, there's no oil in here. It's just raw wood. And this patch box is really deep. Kind of funny to see on this kind of rifle because I imagine you're always close to the range or to your shooting box where you have more caps. And I think having this patch box here is a carryover from uh, the more traditional side and uh, not necessarily match or target specific muzzle loading. We're gonna flip it around here. We just have one lock bolt that I suspect goes all the way through the lock. This other screw here, I think, is just to hold this nice little dainty side plate that we have there, kind of floral in pattern, real simple. Uh, nothing to write home about, but a nice little element on this otherwise blank side plate canvas here. And as we go back here into the cheek piece, we have a nice Star of Bethlehem inlaid in here and attached with a little screw as well. The inlet on this is really nice, feeling across the wood and the inlet itself, you know, no real difference in, uh, in depth or height there, really well done inlay there. I know I said earlier that the curl of this piece isn't, you know, isn't real fancy. I think by design though, the fanciest part of it that I've seen is in our cheek weld and our cheek rest here. It's really common for muzzleloader builders and stock manufacturers of all kinds to place the curl of a piece of wood in key locations, one being the cheek or the patch box side of the stock to really show off that grain and curl. 
and uh, it's it's really pretty as it wraps around um, the carving here for our cheek rest. I'm not too familiar with the maker and the manufacturer of the brass tube sight here or the muzzleloader itself, but I'm, I've got a starting point now. I think maybe this winter when I'm cooped up and uh, huddled up by the wood stove, doing some research on this target rifle the builder, um, I think it's in, in the cards for me here. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to learn more about this muzzleloader, I encourage you to check out the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages. They're doing a lot of great work sharing high quality photos and information about this and many other muzzleloaders as they pass through their halls this fall. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.